I stand firmly in the fact that I'm one of the best to ever do this for the culture, for my coast, and for my city. This is the Best Rapper in L.A. Podcast. 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 And I'm your host, Merce. 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 What up, though? What up, though? What up, though? Brilla 24. The Kobe episode. A lot of people um, have asked me why I'm quitting. I'm not quitting. I'm finishing. You can refer to the Aesop Rock song. I forget the name of it. Well, well, one year passed, and believe it or not, she covered every last inch of the entire sidewalk, and she stopped. Yeah, after all this, you're just giving in today? She said, I'm not giving in, I'm finished. And walked away. Wait, 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 wait. Never liked Kobe. God bless him. God rest his soul. Never liked the Lakers. I have not liked the Lakers. If there is anything that uh, is anti who I am, and being that they're not native Angelinos and I am, it's not as much as people want to make the Lakers LA, they are not LA. I don't know if any sports team is LA. The Los Angeles Kings, the Los Angeles Galaxy, unfortunately, Los Angeles Football Club as well. Angel City, FC, I don't know who else. So some of you sports heathens can correct me. Back to the Lakers. Lakers played at the Forum, Inglewood. Some people say it's LA County, but it's not Los Angeles. If you are a child of the gang-banging era, which is somewhere early 70s till now, I would say, not gang, because there have been gangs in L.A., gang-banging, with, I think, crack in the mix really uh, helped helped it get crazy. When I say at the freebase era, same thing as started hip-hop. If you guys don't know, I equate uh, freebasing. When we get into the White Mandingo's album, we'll talk about the song Mandingo Rally, where I mentioned freebasing. But uh, freebasing has a lot to do with uh, hip-hop culture to me. Um, and how kind of black culture switched because freebasing is what kind of what my father, from my understanding, thought crack was going to be, but it's different than freebasing cocaine. But freebasing changed the dynamic to me of gangs and just black culture in general. So, anyway, if you're from the gang banging era, Inglewood really is in LA. The, I don't want to say elitist, but uh, the, the Lakers aren't a working class team. Like the Celtics have more of a working class aesthetic. Like there's no glitz and glamour to Robert Parrish. D1 called me the Robert Parrish of rap. I love that. Larry Bird, like he's a Hoosier, like, you know. And someone told me that Hoosier is like the N word for white people, for like blue collar, working class people. Um, Kevin McHale. I think that uh, the Lakers never had that. It was all, it's showtime. Literally, Shota, the best thing about the Lakers is Chick Hearn. God bless him. He's one of my favorites. All, because that's how I grew up hearing basketball. Even I was adults rooting for the Detroit Pistons. I never really rooted for the Celtics. I think I could always feel the the racism on, on the Boston Celtics. Just at the organization, there's a lot of racism in that city and segregation and division and the leprechaun. And it always rubbed me wrong. Even though I didn't let, like the Lakers, I should have loved the Celtics. I didn't. But the Detroit there's another blue collar round rough house team that I liked. I didn't like the Bulls because you know Michael Jordan is too still too showtimey, too commercial. So my hatred with the Lakers goes back way, way. And just being an underground artist, an indie artist, an entrepreneur, uh, coming from a blue collar family, like the aesthetic of the Lakers never appealed. And the one time, even when my mom married my stepdad, and we had two incomes, the only time I've been to the former see Lakers, I was l- literally in the last row and could touch, and I touched the ceiling. Because my stepfather was high, I thought it was funny. Like, put me up to touch the seat. I could remember, I remember that game. And never again. Clippers, we could sit halfway down. We know, if you listen to the podcast, I, I, I switched over to the Knicks in high school when I realized I had a choice. But, uh, so Magic Johnson, still, nah. Uh, James Worthy, nah. Kareem, cool. I've made peace. I've tried, like, I had to work through this. Because in my household, my kids say, fuck shit, damn. Um, but we do not use stupid or they try, but stupid, fat, ugly, hate. So I tried to get away from hating the Lakers. I was a Laker hater, admittedly, for years. So I hated Kobe. I didn't hate Shaq because he came from outside and he's hip-hop and, you know, whatever. But I did not care for him when he played for the Lakers. LeBron, don't care for him as he plays for the Lakers, but no hate. Kobe got the brunt of my hate, and I apologize. But as soon as he finished, what I liked, the first thing I liked about Kobe when he was in a Laker uniform was him announcing his retirement. 
unlike some players who decide at the end of the year, he wanted to give all of the people who love the sport of basketball the opportunity to see him play. So when Milwaukee wasn't selling tickets, they sold out on that last Kobe thing. It was good for the league. I think it was just good for the fans. It was just an honorable thing to do. And that's what I will say is he always, to me, served the game with honor. Even when I hated him, I guess there was a level of respect for him. I think a lot of people, especially at that time, Black America didn't respect him as a Black man. And that's a whole nother psychological debate. And, you know, his experiences were beyond that of a Black American, being fluent in Italian, um, living abroad. Uh, even just to me, having a father of that stature kind of eliminates you from a, a genuine Black American experience. Uh, experience to me, typical. I'll say typical, especially from that era, from our era. I love that, and I wanted to do something similar to that as I debated and I talked to Curtis King about it, and he recommended it. And I just think like announcing it is not like, oh, look at me, something I've been planning for almost a decade, and. I wasn't going to announce it. I just wanted to kind of just do J.D. Salinger type shit, disappear. I think that's how it happened with him. But I love that about Kobe. And the more I learned about him post uh, his, when he left the Lakers, I really became fond of him um, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as someone who had um, fucked up a lot publicly and was, you know, openly and publicly refining himself. And, um, uh, making the necessary changes, whether that was good enough for some people or not, who fucking cares? That's where this whole thing comes from for me. Look at God. The 24th episode is how we start talking about Kobe. And at eight minutes, I'm finished talking about Kobe. Amen. God bless him. Yeah. Also leading to this song, 316, on the 316 episode, one of the morals of the story for the MCs that are listening to this younger MCs. Q-Tip once said, extra P, large professor, tell them don't say the date on the song because it dates you. Sports references will sometimes date you. Riz is saying, great hero, Jim Thorpe. That works. What doesn't work is Heat versus Lakers. It kind of works. It depends on which area you're talking about. And I didn't specify. It's just there's an inequity. And I think in the history of the Heat versus Lakers, there's always been like a time when they've been really good and the Lakers have been really bad. So it usually works this year. And may or may not work. A Heat versus Lakers. Um, yeah, and we'll get into some more. But sports references, that's one something to take away from this as a young MC. Make sure that you make, if you're going to make a sports reference, re reference a Hall of Famer. Hey, yo, Bo knows this what? and Bo knows that. But Bo, Bo don't know Jack because Bo can't rap. Well, what do you know? The dead dog is first up to bat. Other than that, <laughs> mentioning franchises may or may not be the best idea. Or just date you like Campy Can't Hold Shaq from end of the beginning mainstream or underground away team hometown it boils down to the facts whack is whack can be can't hold shack basketball very 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 uh influential in hip-hop very f important to the culture i think if they if the culture has the sport it's basketball basketball is my favorite sport i like the way to dribble up and down the court maybe it's because of curtis blow but the accessibility of it you know, it could have been soccer had the American well, government, for whatever reason, decided that uh, it was better to have basketball hoops and spaces to play soccer at parks. We're just going to run through this one um, lyric by lyric and, you know, have a lot of friends. Shout out to my homie, Steph Simon, uh, Auntie Holly, everybody that's listening to this. Thank you. And you guys can give me feedback if this format works. A negative feedback on uh, just DM me, fuck it. Uh, if I, I I check Instagram like every four days now. This is a living legend, Justice League, definitive just presentation.
Brought to you by Ninth Wonder and Merce. What up, though? Still giving a fuck, so open up your tangy and get ready to dump those. So it starts out, this is Living Legends Definitive uh, Justice League Definitive Jux Presentation. If we get through two songs this episode, it'll be it'll, this will be a miracle. This is something that Ninth had me go back and do. He does not care about my little cute intros. As he says, I think Fonte invented little talk. He does not give a fuck about my little talk. But I had, so I have to say, can I go back and add a little talk? To this day, that's how our commu- so communication, but we're just starting our form of communication. So, uh, yeah, I went back and had this little talk. There's a sentiment that used to exist. I think I've kind of like come through and, and I hate to use the word check, but inform people, living legends, even when I separated, I always represented living legends. I was in a lot of rap crews before I got into living legends. And I don't think I've been in another rap crew since then. Def Jux was a label an artist collective, if you call it, but it was legitimately a label. And as you can see, the Justice League was the crew, Living Legends was a crew, and then we got into Definitive Jux presentation. If you're on Def Jux, you're a Def Jucky, but Living Legends has always been my crew. You know, it's kind of, I feel like if you have to compare it to athletics, Ray Lewis will always be a Miami Hurricane. Even The Rock is very Miami Hurricane. Fucking, uh, what's his name? Um, Rohan Marley is very much, much a hurricane. That's another story for forever uh, with Rohan. But uh, Living Legends is my alma mater. So, you know, to me, like, that's I'll always be a living legend, even if I don't go back. My jersey is in the fucking rafters. You can't take me out. I recently read, like, some articles when the new album came out. Former member? No, I'm not a motherfucking former member. You just, it is what it is. No, I'm not a former member inactive I'll, I'll accept that but i'm i am a living legend period i still get checks i still get royalties when the merch sells my logo is still on it i didn't ask them to take it off there's no whatever you want to create to fit your human experience because we like to label and it makes us feel safe to divide things and label things you know expiration date purposes and you know whatever all that's great but if you're hearing from my mouth, I would like you to not get it fucked up. And this is another, it, when, when this album blew up, people, and I stopped touring with Living Legends around this time, people were, oh, you left. I still said Living Legends. It's my crew. I don't know how else to put it, um, except the, the athletes thing, you know. I've worked with a lot of people. I am always going to be from Living Legends, where I came from. And beyond that, I'm always going to be from Mid-City, and that hasn't changed. No matter if people think that my allegiances have changed, I've done with Rhyme Sayers, um, been with Strange Music, you know, but I've never, like I said, I've never told the guys, hey, take my name off the website and take it. And uh, I helped build this. There's no way you can subtract me from it without destroying, to me, without destroying the structure and the the structure, without damaging the structural integrity of the brand. That's it. So that's another example. People thought oh, I left Def Jug after, after in the beginning. However, here it is, me saying it. It's said a couple of times on this album, even said by Fonte. And for Fonte to say it, he, I have to be repping for other people around, you know. It goes down again. J League, living legends. So when no one's around, it's just me in North Carolina, I'm still representing living legends. And that's part of me rapping in this room. And this song was more of aggression um, some of these bars were actually written for um, me getting another shot at at whatever I get on the wake up show, like having those freestyle bars, right? Because I never thought it was cool to say a freestyle that was a written on the radio that I would hear somewhere else. So I was starting to write shit just for the radio. Like I feel some rap having a free a couple freestyles ready that I could just go off, not off the head with, but spit at the drop of the hat that didn't belong to an album that once it was on a reputable show like Stretch and Bob or a uh, breakup show, I would never say it again. Because I hate it when those verses popped up on albums. At this point, I was like, I don't think that's ever going to happen. So I know like the Culver City bus line line comes from that, but let's go back to the beginning. Merce, what up though? Still giving a fuck, so open up your changes and get ready to dump those. Ooh, disc of them dudes that be sounding the same. Merce, what up, though? Still giving a fuck, so open up your change and get ready to dump those. Disc of them dudes that be sounding the same. They get up on TV, steady climbing for fame. 
another dated dated technology will date you i also i also reference friendster later on this album good god Times unchanged, these thugs do what they like. Some of them be your friends to trying to find a new wife. For those of you who don't know, Google it. But yeah, this good and dudes that be sounding the same. They get up on TV, steady clowning for fame. That's from my mom. Um, she's always, oh, you, you stop all that clowning. You clown. Like the worst thing, one of the worst things I could do is clown up at the schoolhouse. I was clowning up at school. Oh, you was clowning in class. I got a call from your teacher that she told me you was clowning. Knowing that my teacher did not use that terminology when you're showing out, when you're acting an ass, when you're misbehaving, when you're seeking attention and being a buffoon to garner, garner that attention. And even if you're not being a buffoon, anything that's bringing you unwanted, unwarranted attention or unauthorized attention is clowning for my mother. And you, who better not get caught clowning in church, clowning in a store. Don't let me catch you clowning up there on a playground. Don't, don't. And... We're going to go deep on this one. The worst thing you could do in black America is have fun. Sounds crazy. Where does that come from? Centuries of slavery. We don't, to this day, my mother, my mother just got her uh, passport and went out of the country for a vacation to Jamaica. She's 70. My mother is a hardworking woman. We are, you know, we got that somehow public opinion changed to lazy and we could talk about how, you know, I think welfare is a, a, a tool to, to force black people into being lazy. But motherfuckers that work for free for 400 years cannot be labeled lazy after 100 years, even if that's, I don't even know if we've been able to draw welfare that long. Um, my stepfather has repeated the history multiple times to me. Something about the movie Claudine and James Earl Jones watching. Keep on. Okay, I remember talking to one of the label execs at Warner Brothers and they were like, Hey, hit me back, man. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later. I'm, I've been on vacation. I'm like, bro, you took three vacations this year. Bro, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't take three vacations this year. I was like, yes, you did. I can show you the email. I said, well, if I did, work hard, play hard, bro. We were just for 400 years, work hard. No fucking play hard. And then we, we got our freedom and everybody's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Figure out actual literacy, financial literacy, freedom, capitalism, all at once. Go, go for it, guys. You're free now. Civil War is over. Emancipation Proclamation, go forth, be great. Like, we don't have centuries of paying taxes, voting. We were still able to vote. We weren't able to shop everywhere. We weren't even able allowed to have bank accounts. You know, so we're criticized for being lazy or not financially literate or literate, and you make fun of our Ebonics. Like, speaking in complete sentences in certain parts of, the, of this country could get you killed. So Ebonics was a shield. Even if you were extremely literate, you had to shield yourself. Commercial. Go see fucking Origin. Go see fucking Origin. Please, everyone listen. If you don't leave me a rating, if you don't, I don't give a fuck. If you don't like my music in, anymore, you hate me as a person, go see Origin. Please go see that film by Ava DuVernay. It is amazing. It is amazing. I get a credit in there for a song that's not really in there, but shout out to my cousin Chris who scored it and um, slid one of our songs in there that we made together. Chris Bauer, shout out to him. Scored Bridgerton. I keep mentioning him. I'm going to mention him. I'm so proud of my cousin. Uh, but... Please go see Origin. I feel like I haven't seen a movie that moved me like this Malcolm since Malcolm X. And that was, I think, if you weren't black, it may have not moved you as much. This moves the world. Very important film. Basically independently done. So it's not getting a lot of push. We as human beings that care need to care about this movie. Care about the book cast. Um, C-A-S-T-E, which the movie is based upon. Done with the commercial. We don't play. So if you notice in the black community, mother, the worst you th one, so one of the worst things you could do is another form of fun, have fun, is you play too much. Motherfuckers who play too much, nigga, you play too much has gotten a lot of people shot. Don't play with me. I am not a play thing. I am not a play toy. I've gone on this rant before on other podcasts, but do not play with a black person. 
Same thing with clowning. Or you think it's a game. It's not a game, motherfucker. I'll show you. You think it's a game? Ooh, shit. Come on! But it's all, you don't really, you don't, we don't relate the psychology back to slavery because you let the overseer catch you clowning or playing or thinking it's a game, picking cotton. You were going to get your ass whipped. And we have transferred that to our children. I'm not one of your little friends. You better not play with me, boy. Or nigga, what you, why you play too much? Those things to me are rooted in, in, a, in a slave mentality. So that's why I say disrespecting ancestors that were bound in them chains right after that. Get up on TV, steady clown of fame, disrespecting ancestors that was bound in. All that goes into that line. They meet together like that. It just sounds like some cool woke shit to say to y'all, but that's what I'm thinking in just that one bar. All that's behind it. Like disrespecting ancestors, clown for fame. So in one way, when we're acting this way, we're disrespecting our ancestors. In another way, clown for fame is like disrespecting our ancestors because we're clowning. Like we're playing too much. So it's 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 kind of a double entendre, kind of the same meaning, but a double meaning. Um, and that's my psychology behind that one bar. Disrespect an ancestor that was bound in the chains, but I'm around in the game, so things is bound to change. Trying to walk that thin line between intelligence and ignorance. Have a little fun while making music of significance. Um, finding out certain rappers that I thought were Muslims ate pork. Finding out pro-black rappers I know that made songs that about. Um, interracial dating and then seeing them with white women. I wasn't mad at them for being human. I was mad at them for portraying and telling me they were somebody they weren't. To me, and then that made the truth that they taught me less credible. As I get older, I learn to separate the human from the message, but rap has so much keeping it real in there. If I find out Denzel Washington really doesn't, hasn't read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I'm not going to be crushed. But if I find out that blah, 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 pro-black rapper um, has three children with three various white girls around the country that that hurt me later on. You know, I was still a kid. like So I always try to be 100% having songs like Batman, Freak These Tales, and The Pain on the same album. There's a spectrum. There's growth. There's country. We're, we're contradictory beings. I get it. But be honest, bro. Like I just thought, but it's not as appealing to go back to there's safety for human beings. We feel comfort in labeling and sectioning things off, especially in America. It's better for capitalism, and it's just better for, I think, in some for some humans, for safety and preservation, self-preservation. This is this, this is that. This is an acorn. This is an almond. This, you know, like, just can't have a bag of nuts because some of us are allergic to it. You know, it's, it's, I get it, but... I try to walk that thin line between intelligent and, and ignorant. I drink, I smoke. I care about the representation of black folks in the media. I care about the upliftment and unity in the black community. I care about the unifying of all humans. However, I still like to fuck. This is what I was trying, not trying, this is what I just decided to let go with no filter. A nemesis to niggas just bumping their gums. I give a fuck where you from. It's where your heart at, bitch. It's an emphasis to niggas just bumping their gums. I give a fuck where you from. It's where your heart at, bitch. You gon' bite little dog, you'll just spark that shit. A slave to the rhythm, knife spark that whip. Still kind of on how Cameron Crowe. I just recently watched Aloha. I love Cameron Crowe. He did Almost Famous, um, Jerry Maguire. I'm all heart, motherfucker. That like the Cuba Gooding. Like it's a movie I watched and a message I internalized. Um, and also me traveling and um, I think it was on the Have a Nice Life, not Have a Life, excuse, excuse me, My Way in the Highway Tour, where I met a young man that is from the exact rival neighborhood. Like, not, not just like, oh, I'm from a blood neighborhood. Uh, he's from a blood neighborhood. I'm from, like, from a rival neighborhood. And we met and we just chopped it up. And it was kind of like, I give a fuck where you're from. It's where your heart, where's your heart? Um, me growing, growing up to see like, you know, whether you're from this gang or that gang, there's a bunch of real motherfuckers and a bunch of fake motherfuckers. Whether you're in this rap crew or this rap crew, there's some motherfuckers who are serious about rapping and there's motherfuckers that are just down for the fame of living legends or rhyme sayers or anti con or whatever your crew is. There's always a core members in every group that are very serious. There are people on the Kansas City Chiefs that are there to collect a ring and there are people who are there who are to, to get the ring. People are going to do just enough to be counted as present and collect a check. And there's people who are dedicated to whatever the mission is. And uh, 
give a fuck where you're from. It's where your heart at, bitch. Like I'm, a, I'm in the East Coast. I don't, you know, we're just coming out. It seemed like it was years ago, but as we zoom out and I meet younger kids and I mentor these younger MCs, like I am from the East Coast West Coast era to them. Like it, there's not really a difference between 2003 and 1997 or 95, 96. As we zoom out, you know, I'm closer to Tupac than I am to Trippy Red. I'm closer to Biggie than I am to Juice World. So give a fuck where you're from. It's where your heart's like part of me trying to like also bring hip hop back together. It's where your heart, you care about the preservation of this culture moving it forward. You gonna bite little doggy or just bark that shit? A line from Quentin Tarantino, Reservoir Dogs. Are you gonna bark all day, little doggy? Or are you gonna bite? Oh, Christ. Hey, look, you two assholes, calm the fuck down. Hey. Took me three times of trying to watch that movie before I got it. My homeboy and uh, having a Magna class in ninth grade or 10th grade in my litter, English lit class, there was a kid I said, shared a, I think I shared a desk with Sean. And he kept telling me he knew I was in the cinema and uh, cinema, black kid in the cinema. And, and, and L, you know, LA was weird. I was ditching. If you know the West Side Pavilion, they had an indie. It always has been, even when they transformed the mall. Now the mall has become apartments. Imagine that. Indie move. I would ditch to go see foreign films uh, in the ninth, tenth grade to see art, indie, indie, indie hip hop, indie cinema. I was left to center. I wish I would like I've said before. I wish I would have done more punk, indie, West Coast punk, and ska. But I was into anything alternative, whether that be crip, cripping, skateboarding, comic books at the time, um, foreign films. I, I I was into consuming left to center art. Uh, so Sean knew that, and he was like, "Yo, you need to see this Reservoir Dogs movie." blockbuster error if i'm gonna spend my mom's money or my money to rent something for the weekend i'm getting one movie every time i rented it i was like why would you know we were woke at hamilton high school we had an ethnic studies program like why would my dark-skinned jewish friend i think he was half el salvadorian and, and jewish if that's a race or however you see it but he was definitely he looked latino but was jewish but looked Latino and he looked like a mixed kid. And uh, but I was like, why would this very conscious hip hop loving person tell me to watch it? And they say nigger. They say nigger in the first or whatever, first five minutes. Fucking guys are acting like a bunch of fucking niggers, man. You working niggers, huh? Just like you two. Always saying they're gonna kill each other. And I couldn't get past it. If there are a bunch of men born in the 50s that are not black and mostly white uh, or Italian, you know, non-black men that are on the other side of the law in the, in, in the early 90s, late 80s, they are not PC. When black people, they're PC enough not to say nigger in front of black people. I think Quentin Tarantino, if you watch American cinema, you would assume that white people only said the word, only people who said nigger were racist white people in the 1950s. Motherfucker, if Fatal Attraction, if Romancing the Stone, if Indiana Jones, if all these movies were written how white people really talk when black people are around, aren't around, there would be a lot more than word. And not out of malice, but just out of ignorance. Pure ignorance. The childlike ignorance, innocence, a borderline innocence ignorance. If you live in Boise, Idaho in the 1970s or 80s, you might not know a black person even though there's a strong black community in Boise, you know, but certain parts of middle America or just America in general, you weren't even allowed to. Why would you be PC? You know, it's wrong to say it, but you don't think there's, there's people who don't think the fucking Confederate flag is wrong. So you're telling me a criminal from the 1970s, like all these films made, it wasn't just Italian mobsters saying Moulinian. It was motherfucker. You, that's how motherfuckers talk. And Quentin Tarantino for whatever reason, gets a lot of flack for a lot of legitimate reasons. But I don't, I appreciate him showing me how certain white people talk when I'm not around. So I'm still aware that there's work to be done. Not that I have to hate these guys. I've sat and had dinner with 80 year old mobsters and talked to them. And I think changed their perspective on what young black men are. We're not going to break down and educate and get past this innocent ignorance without honest conversations. And I'm okay with sitting, if your perception of me is based on lack of experience or knowledge, then I want to sit down and have an experience and educate you in the most polite and human, humane way possible. 
without a fucking sign or a bunch of list of triggers and words you can't say. Say what you got to say for us to have this experience. And once you leave this experiment, should you choose to remain in your ignorance, then I can hold you accountable. So I watched it at the after that understanding. I was like, okay, this is how they talk when I'm running around. I, I can't, the world's not perfect. We still got a lot of work to do. These people are raising children. And rap is helping break down these barriers. And if not, I can have conversations with their children. I look at that as my overall mission as I'm rapping at this point, at 2004, I'm seeing that my fan base is predominantly white. And as we see now, I'm the only black rapper in a lot of these people's top five. Some of them would never have listened to me if I didn't do an album with Atmosphere. A lot of, there's this white rap thing happening on the God Loves Ugly tour. We pull up to a place in South Carolina where we do a show and there's nothing but white rappers on the wall. Highly offended. These are things that I have to not be offended by. I'm, you know, the only one of two Black performers on the Warp Tour that summer going into this album. I'm representing my people to people who are willingly or subconsciously segregating themselves from Black America. And I've penetrated their bubble. And when I come in here, I have to come in with a certain amount of thick skin and to me, on my best behavior, unfortunately, fortunately, or just my most authentic behavior, I would say. Having these tough conversations without a chip on my shoulder, without ready to jump on, ready to hear you out before I slap the shit out of you or or cut you off. Go see Origin, you know, and that is not on probably par with what, what they're saying, what that message of that film is way more elevated and um, finessed and uh, researched. <laughs> So, 316 continues. Slave to the rhythm, nice spark that whip because my heart can't quit. Back to heart. I got something to say. And I, I'm not the best rapper, but I have a lot more heart and dedication and I work harder than a lot of motherfuckers. And last week's episode where I talk about the girl telling me it's not your dick size, it's not how you look, it's, it's just you. That's the heart. That's the core. That's my, that's my, um, as my uh, life coach says, that is my soul print. That is it. Like, you know, I put my soul print, put my heart into everything I do. I try to be as authentic as I can in that moment. It's not always the best version of myself. It's not the most perfect version of myself, but I would hate to say that I was being someone other than myself. Something I learned through gangbanging, through uh, my family, even subconsciously through the Bible. Jesus died for being his authentic self. Are you the son of God? I'm not going to say I'm not. Go ahead and kill me. Like that type of, you know, are you from such and such gang? Yeah, well, it is what it is. That type of authenticity. But me having the freedom to shift into hopefully a better version of myself and not stay stuck in my authentic self of the past. And a slave to the rhythm, back to the ancestors and chains, still referencing that. All this is conscious. All this is going on. But to y'all, it's just 16 bars. Slave to the rhythm, nice spark that whip from ancestors and chains. Hard can't quit. I got something to say. Since these niggas want to act, NWA, niggas with artillery and nothing to spray. Just some non writing assholes with nothing to say. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the self explanatory, really fed up with. Uh, we'll get to a line here later, but I'm not fed up with gangster rap. If you're living that, if that's reality, great. If that's not your reality and you can articulate it in an artistic manner, I'm a little more tolerant. But man, if you can't write and you're not doing this shit, that's the shit. When it started to be motherfuckers who couldn't rap and wasn't really about that life, and not that I am, but I've the most frustrating thing to me is I've seen it. I just recently sat down with one of my homies who at this point has probably been incarcerated longer than he's been free in his life. If you can imagine that. I know a lot of you don't have the um, privilege of, and I say it's a privilege because uh, it, it grounds me, um, gives me a lot, of, a lot of perspective and insight. Privilege of knowing someone that's been incarcerated for longer than they've been free. And the streets are still very, very real, beyond real. This is some shit he sat down and showed me told me that shook me to my fucking core. And there's not a lot of shit that could shake me. I've seen some shit, yet, yet it's still, the streets of Los Angeles never failed to, uh, to scare the shit out of me. And when I say I'm from the streets, I mean like I, I'm from the crosswalk. 
I know how to walk around. I know to, I know how to behave and get across these motherfuckers without getting hit. God willing, I can stay that way. But I'm not living in it like these motherfuckers are at 40 and 50 years old still. Shit is mad real outside. So when some, I've seen it so I can see it in your eyes because I've sat with motherfuckers that kill motherfuckers for nothing. Not sat with them, but no, seen, I've, I've known motherfuckers like that and I've seen motherfuckers become that motherfucker. I've seen kids I know that are a hell of a basketball player becomes murderers. So when I look at you and even your music video, my nigga, I can see that shit because I don't have to, I don't, I, I don't have to be able to, you may even be willing to, to try do stuff to prove it, but I know it's not coming from an authentic place. You haven't experienced a certain trauma that has made you into this person. You are choosing to be this person, and that is infuriating, um, insulting. It drives me, um, you know, and at one point, I think, it, you know, as I we get to later on this album, I'm like, man, this could have got me fucked up. But that's what I take a stance against. There's room for everyone to tell their authentic story. But if you are becoming a killer or a crack salesman to buy new Jordans because your mommy won't buy them for you even though she can afford them or she can afford you adequate uh, footwear and you're selling, you're destroying our community to do that. And in the process of that, you harm and kill other black men as long as, so, as far as, and in addition to the families you disrupt by poison, or you're just acting like it and putting this message out there and benefiting off, I'd rather have a real gangster make poor rap music. So at this point, you're not contributing to the art and you're definitely destroying the community. So, um, yeah, all this is going into what I'm saying. Then Joe Scudder comes on. My white friend who talks shit very well, all of these are one take. Then we get into, um, I'm from where we leave it running and we hop out of cars, jump out, beat you down and some new all-stars. Most salty ass sideways ass motherfuckers. Y'all fucked up now, huh? Get I'm from where we leave us running and we hop out of cars. Jump out and beat you down and some new all stars. No stars and stripes, just bars and pipes. And niggas just start shooting. They too hard to fight. For me, that came from a memory of what up though? I start the verse. What up though? Um Merce, what up though? Still giving it's my brother once again. I'm saying I am my security blanket, my 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 safety, my family. There was a time when <laughs> Uh, someone saw my brother literally trying to sell him some oregano or something and he pulled up on that motherfucker and it just he saw him and I was in the car and my brother was very careful not to do that kind of shit around me as I was him whatever you know we we kept uh, trying to keep each other out of our shit but he like hey cuz like just boop pull up in the driver er, er. and then uh he thought my brother was by himself so he tried to play him out a little bit so then I hopped out. Like he left the car running, hopped out, and I hopped out too. And then it just became a thing. And we'll leave it at that. But that's the visual I'm coming with right there. My brother's old Bronco that I crashed into <laughs> the check cashing place on uh on La Brea and Pico, which was a moment. And that's what the beauty of community. I don't know if kids have community now, regardless of gang shit or whatever. When I crashed, it's about five blocks from the hood from like Pico and Cloverdale, maybe seven blocks. Bro, I was making a right going to pick up some tapes my brother let me use his car i didn't have a license i don't think i had a license he let me use his car to go to whittier to pick up some tapes or pasadena wherever i was going to pick up tapes and uh i didn't look at the crosswalk or someone's crossing when they weren't supposed to so i drove up on the sidewalk to miss them and then when i got on the sidewalk of course someone was walking on the sidewalk so then i just turned into the building hit the gas i mean hit the glass shattered knock the gumball machines in like if you know check cashing place there's the lines and there's the bulletproof glass and then there's, you know, you use some type of vending machines they used to have for a gumball and stuff. I hit that, shot that. I don't know if I hit a kid with that. Um, but everything was okay. Nobody was hurt. No ambulance. I wasn't hurt. I didn't hit the person on the sidewalk, so I was happy. I was embarrassed, but as we talked about the shitting on the floor incident, I get over myself real quick. I don't think that highly of myself to begin with, so I can laugh at myself. But, man, cause some motherfuckers came from all over the head. <laughs> Niggas was driving down from Cloverdale. Mansfield, everyone, <laughs> La Brea, Orange Drive, like, motherfucker, hey, this nigga Nick crashed into the check cash because, like, it was, oh, man, it turned into a whole scene. Of course, my brother was hot. I did later, when he was started going to University of Florida, I did buy him a Tahoe when I had my little rap money. Partially because of that, partially because I love him, but, uh, yeah, man, a used Tahoe, suburban something. I, I don't even think, I did get to ride it, I think, but, um, 
Yeah, that was. <laughs> That's what happened to that Bronco. That's where the visual comes from. Hopping out of the car, beat you down. There's some new all stars. No stars and stripes. No America, just bars and pipes. I really hated that line. I didn't want to rhyme that, but I just got over it. Bars, meaning like the bars on home, the bars in the penitentiary. Also in my neighborhood, the bar where all the homies from the neighborhood gang hung out. Bars and pipes, crack pipes, weed pipes, bars and pipes. And niggas just start shooting. They too hard to fight. Talking about this battle rap energy, whenever I do get aggressive, there's also a fear of retaliation. If you if you win, you still lose. Uh, like Tupac just said, for one, if I win, I'm gonna beat that ass. For two, if I lose, I'm gonna beat that ass. So pop two quarters in Pop Tart, and you know, uh, that's the that's that's the you know scar for life. Charge this mic with bars of fright. The fear that I fear, the fear that I am trying to put into those MCs who are whack or uh, not good for the culture and the community. Bars of Fright is a du the duality that charges Mike with bars of fright. The fears that I have, like we get into walk like a man later, it's a fear I have had constant, consistently um, since probably third grade, since the first person I know got shot and killed. Seven, eight years old, like that fear has been there of like, oh, people my age can die and die from gun violence and hearing guns shot and gun battles and drive-bys in the alley and shit like that. So the charge is Mike with bars of fright. Dare any one of you frauds to bite a raw as life with loss of wife causing strife, spitting sharp wit like a floss with knives, hoping I'm speaking in that to existence. Those are all cheap, you know, like that's like flaw, like spitting sharp wit like a floss with knives. It's not really a, the best metaphor, but it's cute. It's more for the rhyme scheme. No stars and stripes, just bars and pipes. And niggas just start shooting, they too hard to fight. I'm scarred for life and charge this mic with bars of fright. Dare any one of you frauds to bite. Not contrived or conceited on your radio, repeat it. Once again, the, uh, about being authentic, realizing that a lot of independent hip hop is an elitist mentality. I'm elitist. And elitist, red hot like Kiedis. I believe this is the first Anthony Kiedis line I know of. I'm going to keep doing this till Kamani uh, fact checks me uh, or anyone else out there. Red hot like heat is not controlled or conceded on your radio. Repeated, I'm a leader, and I lead us red hot like heat is. I'm a California cater and a street narrator. Steady running rappers down until they meet their maker. Californication, one of my favorite albums, any genre. Definitely my favorite Chili Peppers album. I think uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers is the greatest band to ever come out of California. Close second to Green Day and Sublime. Rancid. All oh, those are top five. I'm not a Rage fan. Don't argue with your mama if you want to, you know, whatever. Fishbone. Those are, to me, the top, I'm um, going off the head, but top five to me. Um, unless we're talking war. There's a lot of great bands, but um, I'm going with uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers for my personal favorite. Um, but uh, there's room to argue. Porcelain. Uh, Californication just, to me, can't be beat. Oh. Are you wasting away in your skin? Are you missing the love of your kin? Drifting and floating and fading away. Porcelain. Do you smell like a girl when you smile? Anyway. Red Hot Like He Just Read Scar Tissue, the book. Read it, it's great. I haven't had a chance to read Flea's book. I probably won't until my kids, all my kids get in at least junior high school because there's no, I don't know. If you're a parent and you find time to read more than two books a year, maybe even one, let me know how you do it. I'm not talking audio books. I'm talking about reading. If you can find, if you find a way to do that, uh, let me know. The most I can manage is the scripture of the day or one chapter of the Bible of the day uh, on my phone, if I'm lucky. The... Uh, Leads only regular, you know, California cater, play on that. But also, I was definitely California that liked to fornicate at the time. Street narrator, running rappers down till they meet their maker. Con cheat caretaker. That's first. I always like that. Um, I like that from Broken Language um, when he says, uh, the body, the concrete meter, the blood skeeter on Broken Language uh, by Trigger the Gambler and his brother Smooth the Hustler. I always thought that that was so dope the girl cheaters to be fast beater the street sweet keeper the body the concrete meter the blood skeeter the weed smoker the liver choker the spot stock broker 
because it's like the body to concrete meter. Are you the person meeting the bodies to the concrete? Or are you the meter that measures how many bodies meet the concrete? I know that he probably wasn't thinking on that level, but when I heard that, I was like, oh shit, the body to concrete meter. So I think concrete caretaker to these weak imitators, screech to my Slater, this is before. <laughs> Now I can go both the reverse, kind of like Heat versus Lakers, Screech to my Slater. If you're talking when Saved by the Bell was on, you get Screech versus Slater. If you're talking about later on when Screech got cocked diesel and and Mario Lopez was hosting the fucking, still hosting the pay-per-view channel in hotels across America, um, looking kind of frail. He's look, not looking like Slater anymore. Screech looked like he beat that ass. So that that didn't age well either, but it still made sense. Piece of beef to a gator. Concrete can't take it to these weak imitators. They screech to my slate, a piece of beef to a gator. Or the heat versus Lakers. I'ma speak to you later and let nine take me out with techniques in the faders. In the faders, in the faders, in the faders, in the faders. That was kind of like a shot at ninth because I think my brother was already at uh, UF at the time. And uh, ninth is an FSU fan. I'm from L.A., He's from um, Winston-Salem, but he is a Florida Seminoles fan, and I am a Florida Gators fan. I say the semen holes, you say Seminoles. You know, no disrespect to the indigenous people, just disrespect to that team. It's also after I'm coming off of FSU. No, find out FSU is a whole ass gang somewhere for punk rock people or hardcore, whatever the fuck. DMS, I just, yeah, I'm learning about all kind of uh, whole height gangs that I was not aware of, thanks to Mr. Dibbs. And the warp tour, piece of beef to a gator or the heat versus Lakers. I'll speak to you later at night. Take me out with techniques and a fader. My goal for this song was to, and maybe this is one of the I one of the ones I may have wrote to before I got there. And I think that's where the aggression comes from because we laid this one in hustle. I'm gonna say early on because I had these written. I wanted to scratch something from I forget. Maybe it's that that's how it is. It's a casual remix where he goes on the motherfucking microphone, nigga. High roll glyphics. On the motherfucking microphone, nigga. <laughs> shit. High yeah. roll glyphics. Yeah. Coming with that shit. Uh -huh. uh, but I want to say on the motherfucking microphone. I wanted him to scratch that. And he's like, no, we're going to have Joe Scudder. So this is one of our first deal disagreements. What's wrong with y'all, man? What the fuck was y'all thinking about? Damn. I'm going to fuck this lame, man. Get your shit right, man. All right, we're going to pause it right there for this week's episode. Uh, it's a good place to stop, and our producer, Rob, is on his way out of the country to enjoy some much-deserved time off. So I didn't want to put too much on his plate. This was a long episode, so we just split it into two, even though it's two verses in the last verse. But as you can see, I'm expounding upon every bar. So there's a, a whole episode's worth on the third verse and some next week. If you want to hear it right now, you can always join Patreon. On the Patreon, you can join for as little as a dollar. Patreon.com slash M-U-R-S 316. How fitting. Uh, this episode, only correction I have is uh, spitting sharp wit like I floss with knives is not a metaphor. It's a simile, but uh, no one else probably cares. And I'm using the word psychology, and I mean it in the same way Dr. Dre is a doctor. You know, psychologist, my thought process. I know it's not an exact science. See you next week or sooner. If you join the Patreon, I forgot, we have pitching the Patreon. We have pictures and stuff from different episodes, plus a fuck ton of freestyles and songs that I've never released on any streaming platform. And you get all access to it for as little as a dollar a month, as much as $25 a month. We appreciate your support. No one told you, I love you. Thanks for listening to the Best Rapper in L.A. podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on Spotify, Apple, wherever it is. If you like the show, leave a review on Apple Music or Spotify. And to support the podcast directly, go to patreon.com slash M-U-R-S 316, March 316. See y'all next week. Peace. Peace.